and welcome to CO 738 Probabilistic Methods. Today we'll be applying the Lovas Local Lemma. So what is the Lovas Local Lemma? To remind you from last time there were two versions. The symmetric version, which has a set of, supposes a set of events, A1 up to AN, in an arbitrary probability space, and assumes that for each AI there is a set DI of which AI is mutually independent of all the events outside of di, and that di has size of most d, that the probability of ai is at most p for all i, and that d and p are related by this formula e p d plus 1 is at most 1. And then we concluded that the probability that none of the events happen happens with positive probability. So this was the local lemma wherein we have events that are somehow mostly independent as captured by this idea of mutual independence, and that each of them is rather low in probability, and then we get this desired outcome of avoiding all the bad events. And then we also had the general version, which was similar, but wherein instead of P and D, we instead suppose that there exists Xi in zero up to less, strictly less than one, where the probability of Ai is at most Xi, the product of one minus Xj, where the Ajs are in the Di. So somehow there, allowed to vary and depend as long as these xi satisfy the formula. Then we once again conclude that the, the probability of them happen is positive. So that's our symmetric version and the general version. We'll do a little bit with the general version today, mostly using the symmetric version. So today we'll be applying the local lemma to various problems. Uh, as I said before, it has many applications. This is just a small sample of that, but we'll be looking at property B in hypergraph coloring, uh, one of our favorite topics from before, multicolored sets of real numbers. We'll return yet again to Ramsey theory, and then we'll finish up with a result in geometry. So let's begin with property B. So recall a hypergraph H has property B, i.e. it's two colorable if there exists a two coloring of the vertices of H, such that no edge is monochromatic. So before we calculated various bounds on uh, the number of edges needed to not have property B, uh, and here we can get a bit better by using the local lemma, we can show that if H is a hypergraph where every edge has size at least K, and intersects at most d other edges, so the edges are kind of large and don't intersect too much, where we require that e times d plus 1 is at most 2 to the k minus 1, then h has property b. So if you don't have too many edges, where now instead of just total number of edges, we're looking at more in terms of their intersection and versus their size, then we can conclude that h is too colorable. So we'll prove this with the local lemma. The inequality there should remind you of the inequality from the symmetric version of the local lemma. And indeed, that's how we'll do it. So let's proceed to the proof. The proof, we consider a random two coloring of V of H. So now we just want to avoid uh, monochromatic edges. So what do we do? We have our bad events, AF, be the event that the edge F is monochromatic. Uh, we note the probability of AF is 2 over 2 to the F, which since every edge has a size at least K is at most 2 to the 1 minus K, and we'll define that to be RP to use in the local lemma. So there's our bad events. We have their probability. We have to discuss their dependencies. So we'll let DF be the set F prime of edges where F prime intersect F is non-empty. And by assumption, this number of intersecting edges, this df, is at most d, and yet af is clearly mutually independent of anything outside. So any edge it doesn't share vertices with, uh, the event that f is monochromatic is mutually independent of all those uh, other events outside. And thus we can conclude by the Lovas local lemma since ep d plus 1 is at most 1, because remember p is 2 to the 1 minus k, so we put that on the other side, get 2 to the k minus 1 there. We'd have with positive probability none of the events AF hold, which means precisely that there is a 2 color of H with no monochromatic edge. And that concludes the proof. So that's a, a very nice, simple result showing the power of the local lemma to prove things where you just have local conditions. Uh, I will note, though, the theorem is quite nice. It implies that for every k at least 9, that any k uniform k regular hypergraph has property b. So if your regularity, that's the degree there, and your uniformity are the same and that's large, then indeed we are even too colorable. 
More than that, more generally, you can run the same proof, uh, but with any number of colors to conclude that the chromatic number of hypergraph H is at most, uh, basically, you would have E, you'd have the number of edges it intersects, which you can use with the maximum degree of vertices. So you could do K delta H minus one plus one. Uh, and if you solve for the number of colors that would work with the probability, you'd get that number to the one over K minus one root, say plus one. So that would be on the order of uh, the maximum degree to the one over K minus one. So this is a bit different uh, than for graph coloring. So with graphs when K is two, you'd have on the order of max degree, which is actually trivial, you could just use the greedy argument to get delta plus one, but here we can use the local lemma for uh, larger uniformities to show that you can actually do, say, square root of delta when k is three, and more generally this delta, the one over k minus one. Uh, so that's rather nice, and so that's an application to hypergraph coloring, sort of property B, and then more generally uh, for bounds on the chromatic number of hypergraphs in terms of their max degree. So on to our next topic, which is a little bit more involved. It's on the multicolored sets of reals. So if C is a K coloring of the real numbers, R there, and T is a subset of R, then we say T is multicolored with respect to C if all K colors appear in T. So this is a bit different of a flavor. Instead of trying to get a coloring somehow avoiding monochromatic edges, uh, you can instead think maybe we want those edges to actually be multicolored somehow more rainbow, that we want to make sure all of the colors really appear in a set. So what sets we'll be interested in? Well, there's this nice theorem of Eridos and Lovas from their original paper introducing the Lovas local lemma that goes as follows. If we let M and K be integers such that they satisfy this somewhat crazy formula, uh, E M M minus one plus one times K times one minus one over K to the M, if that's at most one, then for any set S of M real numbers, there exists a K coloring of the reals such that each translation x plus s is multicolored. So this is a bit crazy of a theorem that I give you a set of m real numbers and I tell you that indeed we have somehow uh, enough, we not have uh, not too many colors, then we can guarantee that the translations are actually uh, multicolored. So again, for every real, there's all, there's an infinite many, many translations we're trying to get in, condition on all of them. So this seems a bit hard, but we're going to do it. And we'll note that the above any inequality holds when m is actually bigger than 3 plus little y1 k log k. So if m is about k log k, so if the number of colors is more like m over log m, then indeed we'll be able uh, to do this. So how are we going to, to prove that such nice colorings of the reals exist, where every possible translation is multicolored? Well, we'll do the trick where we look at finite sets first. So we'll first, our first claim is that if instead I'm only interested in a finite set of the translations, so we'll call this X, if X is finite, we claim that there exists a K coloring of R such that each translation X plus X, S where X is in X is multicolored. So if we're only looking at a finite number of translations, we claim we can do this. So let's prove that. The proof, we'll use the local lemma, so we'll let Y uh, be all of the numbers that appear in these translations, so take the union of all of these translations, and consider a random k coloring of y as is standard here. So then what do we do with this random k coloring? Well, we want to avoid bad events. What are the bad events? Well, we want to ensure that every x plus s is multicolored, so a bad event ax will be the event that x plus s is not multicolored. So notice the not there. Then what's the probability of ax? It's a little bit harder to calculate, but you can upper bound this with the union bound, right? So that must, if it's not multicolored, it means it avoids one of the colors. So we can say, oh, this is at most by union bound, the sum over the i and k, that probability that x plus s avoids i. And what is that? Well, if it avoids i, then each uh, number, there's m of them in the translation, would have to get one of the other k minus one colors. So you get one minus one over k to the m times k, because there's k of the terms, we'll define that to be our so uh, we know that the probability of AX is at most this, this value P, this K times one minus one over K to the M, which you saw uh, in the inequality from the theorem. Then we're almost done. Well, then we prove, go on to dependencies. So we have these bad events. We have an upper bound of the probability. Now we consider that we set the set 
dx to be x prime and x, where the, the translations intersect. So x plus s intersects x prime plus s. So then what do we have? Well, we will note that dx is at most m times m minus 1. So if we have, uh, we have our set x uh, plus s, when does it intersect? Well, you can think through, but again, each we have only m real numbers, so you're going to just get m times m minus 1 there. We'll set that to be d. And thus, Ax is mutually independent of everything that it doesn't intersect. Since it doesn't have any intersecting vertices, we'd, they would be mutually independent of what happens outside of those vertices, the other vertices receiving their colors. So once more about the Lovas local lemma, since E P D plus 1 is at most 1, with positive probability, none of the events Ax hold. That means that all of these translations are indeed multicolor. So that's quite nice, and, and again, that inequality holds by the inequality from the theorem, where we plug in d to be m, m minus 1, p to be that number above, uh, and we get what we want. So that shows it works for finite. So if you have a finite set, then really we can just do a random coloring and use the local lemma to say, well, really you only have these local dependencies, so we can indeed get a coloring where all the translations are multicolor. The issue is we need to prove this for the infinite set. We need to prove it when x is actually all of the reals for all of the translations. So how do we do that? Well, that comes from what's called the standard compactness argument. So we complete the proof using the following standard compactness argument. So if you haven't seen this before, let's go through it. Well, recall a topological space is compact if every open cover has a finite subcover. So that's the standard definition now of compactness in topological spaces. And our goal here is to translate the finite result into the infinite, to, to translate that if we know for every finite, it'll hold for an infinite. It doesn't always work, but it works under compact spaces, as you'll see. So we'll note that a discrete space with k points is trivially compact. So if we just look at one vertex and the k possible colors, that's a compact space. And importantly, we have Tikhonov's theorem from 1935, which is equivalent to the axiom of choice, which we will assume. Uh, which says that the arbitrary product of compact spaces is compact. So that's a quite beautiful theorem. We won't go through the proof. Again, it's equivalent to the axiom of choice, so it's more of an axiom. Uh, how do we use this? Well, it means that it implies that the space of all k colorings of R is compact. So if you view each vertex as this discrete space, then the, co the k colorings of R is the product of all those. It's an arbitrary product. It's uncountable there, but it's still compact by Tikhonov's theorem. So what good is this? Now, well, now we can use topology. So we note that in this product space, any set of colorings where a finite subset has a fixed coloring is closed. And also it turns out open. And, and more generally then by finite union intersection, we would actually have then, uh, if you uh, look at a, fix, a finite subset and then fix a, a set of possible colorings and their various extensions, that too would be closed or open. So you could work out the simple topological proofs of those, but this means we can conclude the following, that for every x and r, uh, the real numbers, we'll let cx be the set of k colorings of the reals, such that x plus s is multicolored. So we're going to look at the set of k colorings where indeed uh, we have that x plus s is multicolored. And from above, we find that cx is closed. So think about that. Why? Well, x plus s is, is a finite, you know, s is m real numbers, is a finite uh, subset of R. And the multicolored sets, there's just various colorings of that set, which allow it to be rainbow, to be multicolored here. And so we're just the union of those possible colorings extended off to R. So from, the, from above, we know that Cx is indeed closed for each x. It's also open, but we're just going to use the closed. So what do we do then? Well, if the intersection of these Cx over all x and r is non-empty, that means the desired coloring exists, right? So if, uh, you know, Cx is the set of colorings where x plus s is multicolored, so if, if they're all intersection, if all of them is non-empty, that means there is some coloring uh, where all of these translations are multicolored as desired. So we may assume instead that the intersection is actually empty. And now here's where compactness comes in, because now you look at the complements, right? If we have Cx, we can look at its complement Cx bar, 
And what do we know then? Then we know that the, if the intersection of all the CX is empty, the union of all the complements is the whole space, which means that these complements, these CX bars, form an open cover of R. Uh, but, uh, oh no, sorry, open cover of the K colorings. So we know that they're an open cover of this product space, the K colorings of R. So by compactness, it has some finite subcover. So namely, there is some finite X where if we take these, the complements of these colorings, so the colorings where they're not multicolored, uh, then their union uh, will indeed cover everything. But we already showed that this is a contradiction because there's always at least some coloring uh, where they're all multicolored. So indeed their intersection should be not empty, but we would have concluded that their intersection uh, for this finite X is empty. And that's a contradiction. So that concludes the proof. So this is what we mean by a standard compactness argument. If you've seen it, you're used to this. But basically, uh, if we have can prove something for finite sets or finite uh, subsets, properties, subhypergraphs, and we know somehow that the, the properties themselves are, are closed, then if we can actually extend this using compactness, if you can show they're non-empty. Uh, so you might want to study this proof. We'll return to it again in, in our result in geometry, but this very nice standard compactness arc. So we proved the finite with the local lemma, and then we used compactness to extend it to this infinite realm. So now we'll turn to our third topic of the day, which is lower bounds for Ramsey numbers. Now you might say, well, why are we doing this again? Well, we're doing it again, right? So we had our very basic bound uh, for using the probabilistic uh, method. We used alteration to improve that a bit a couple weeks ago. Now we use the local lemma to improve it again. So namely, we'll show the following theorem, that if E times K choose two times N minus two choose K two K minus two, times two to the one minus k choose two is less than one, then the Ramsey number RKK is greater than N. So we get a new inequality on Ramsey numbers. So let's go ahead and do this proof. You might want to pause and do it yourself using the local lemma as that inequality is very suggestive of using the local lemma. So what's the proof? We consider a random two coloring of the edges as we have done before. We now want to have avoid these bad events. So what are our bad events? We have AS be the event where S is monochromatic, where S is a subset of size K of the vertices. The probability of AS is two to the one minus K choose two. We'll define that to be P. So before we did things such as we just use the union bound to upper bound the union of these probabilities and hope they were less than one and avoid them. Then we used alteration to say, well, actually we could delete some of the vertices uh, and then hope it still holds. But here we'll use the local lemma. So namely, we look at the dependencies. So we let ds be the sets t of size k, where s intersect t is at least two, so where they share an edge. That's the ones you somewhat depend on, right? In particular, we know that as is mutually independent of all the other events, of all the other set k sets where they don't share edges. And it's easy to see that ds is at most uh, k choose two times m minus two times choose k minus two, which we'll set to be our d. Why is that? You would have to choose an edge, that's k choose two, and then you have to choose the rest of the vertices, and they'd have some overlap because maybe you choose three or more, so it's actually strictly less. And now we're just done because we assumed in that assumption in the theorem that E times P, which is the two, one minus k choose two, and the D, which is the, uh, which we can assume is actually strictly less than the product of those numbers, uh, it, we assumed it's uh, then at most one. And so with pros positive probability, none of the events AS hold. So not, there are no K sets monochromatic. And so we indeed uh, avoid that. So that means the Ramsey number would have to be larger than M. So the above theorem, if you do out the calculations, can be used to show that RKK is greater than the square root of two over E, one plus little o one of K times two to the K over two. That should sound familiar because that's actually a factor two improvement over the basic lower bound. So when we just used the basic union bound, the square root two was on the bottom. Uh, when we used all alteration, we got rid of it altogether, and now we actually have a square root two on top. So yet another improvement. So in our long running improvement uh, on the uh, Ramsey lower bounds, and this is really the best that's known using the local lemma to do this random construction. But you might say, okay, that's not very impressive. We just, in fact, do improvement. 
We'll continue on, though, to note that actually for off-diagonal Ramsey numbers, th this local lemma approach can actually be used to improve the numbers quite a bit by actually orders of, of magnitude. So let's just do this for RK3, kind of the most basic interesting one. We'll go through how the approach would work for that for the local lemma. So consider a random two coloring of EKN. Uh, we did this before with just kind of union bound. We saw in some homework that you could use alteration to improve that. Here uh, we'll do it with the local lemma. And again, the key is you, you don't do every edge half and half. We have each edge say blue, if we're doing blue red colorings with probability P. So we're gonna have a knob there of P, which we'll choose later uh, to optimize this. But we consider random two coloring where an edge is blue with probability P and red with probability one minus P. And then we do the standard thing. So we have to avoid our bad events. So that would say be where the triangles T are blue and we'll call those events AT. And the probability, of course, of that is P cubed. You need the three edges to be all blue. And then similarly, you want to avoid, say, events BS, where S is of size K, and you want those to be red. So you want to avoid uh, red K sets. And their probability is one minus P to the K choose two, of course, as each edge needs to be red. So we would do that standard setup. And, and now before you might do uh, some union bound or you might do alteration, here we need to do the local lemma. You'll notice that these probabilities are different. Uh, they, so we shouldn't really use the symmetric version wherein we have the same bound. We should instead use the general version where we have two different events. And so you'd have to look to the dependencies and we look then to the dependencies by this type of event. So each triangle, well, it depends on at most three N of the other triangles. So, because they need, if they need to share an edge to depend, then it would mean that you'd have to uh, choose an edge, there are three of those, and then at most one other vertex. And similarly, you could just upper bound that over all the possible S sets that it depends on at most N choose K uh, of these Bs. And similarly, each uh, K set depends on at most, well, you'd have to choose an edge, that's K choose two, and then another vertex to end of the triangle, which say is upper bounded by N minus two, that would be at most K squared N over two of the triangles. And say again, just being a bit sloppy here, do n choose k for the other sets. So we could see the dependencies, and that means we could apply the general local lemma if we can find uh, x and y in zero up to strictly less than one. So these would be the xi's, but I'm going to choose one x for each of the triangles and a y for each of the k sets. So then the local lemma, general local lemma conditions boil down to when I'm a triangle, my probability is p cubed. I need that to be at most my value x times one minus x to the number of triangles I depend on, so that'd be three n, and one minus y to the number of, of s as I depend on n choose k. Similarly, I would need one minus p to the k choose two, my probability for k sets, to be at most y, my value, times one minus x to the number of triangles I depend on, which is k squared n over two, to one minus y the number of k sets I depend on, again, upper bounded by n choose k. So if those conditions hold, then we could avoid all of these monochromatic events, so none of them would happen, and we conclude that there is indeed a coloring without these monochromatic edges, that is that RK3 is greater than N. So then it's just a question of trying to optimize P, X, Y, and you know, N in terms of K, and do this. And, and indeed this has been done, so Spencer in 1977 uh, use this to show that RK3 is indeed uh, omega of k squared over log squared k. And Erdos actually in 1961 had already shown that with a much more uh, involved probability argument. This one is nice as it's somehow the standard one but using the local lemma. Again, the local lemma wasn't invented until 1975, so you can't blame Erdos for not using it in his proof, but Spencer then in the 70s it had been shown and so was able to use it to give a new and shorter proof of this RK3 result. So how would you do that? We won't go into the details, but essentially you'd pick uh, up to constants, P to be approximately square root of N, K would be approximately root N log N, which is what you need for the above to hold. Uh, we'd set X to be approximately N to the negative three Fs, Y to be approximately one over uh, N choose K, so if you plug those in, you know, one minus y, if y is one over n choose k, that's, that right term is roughly one over e. Uh, the p cubed, of course, is n to the negative three halves, which aligns with x, uh, roughly. 
and then the middle term is is um, ends up being rather uh, small, so also like on the order of e, or even smaller, closer to even larger, closer to one. Uh, for the bottom term, you know, you could go through through it, but you get this. It's a little more delicate there, but uh, sorry, p would want to be that's a typo uh, one over root n, of course. Um, so you'd end up doing that out, but it'll end up balancing as well that uh, the second term there. So you work out the exact contents, constants, but uh, you will get it to work. So let's not do that. I will note that Kim in 1995, in, in a very celebrated paper, showed that RK3 is actually, uh, you can be improved to k squared over log k, which by earlier results of others is typed. So RK3 is on the order of k squared over log k. But this generally this local lemma attempt can be used and it was by Spencer to improve these smaller off diagonal numbers. So if you think instead of three, if you want to do RK4, RK5, you can get uh, rather good and, and better balance than just using the basic uh, method to improve these uh, off diagonal Ramsey numbers. And you can see how you do that. So instead of, you know, three instead of cubed, you'd have to put in for the other smaller numbers, you'd get Two sets, of two sets of inequalities like this, and you'd have to optimize the choices of the x and y and, and n to make this work, um, but you could do that. All right, so that concludes all I wanted to say about Ramsey numbers. Now we'll move on to geometry. So our last result of the day is kind of a nice um, pulling together of these. So we started off with basic property B, that was nice. We did multicolored sets where we showed off a compactness argument. We did a little bit with the general local lemma on uh, Ramsey numbers, but now let's let's do something in geometry. So how does this work? So it's about the following. Here's the key definition. Family F of open unit balls in R3 is a k-fold covering if every x in R3 is in at least k balls of F. So you might be used to the notion of a covering. We talked about it uh, in hypergraphs, but here uh, we're trying to cover the space R3, the three-dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, so that would be if, if every point is in at least one ball, but now we want k-fold, so we want to make sure we cover a lot of times. And then what's the other key concept we'll need is decomposable. We'll say a family F is decomposable if there exists disjoint F1 and F2 in F, where each Fi is a covering of R3. So a, a one-fold covering, that it's each one's in at least one ball. So this is quite nice. I have suggestive that of the question, you know, I have a k-fold covering, so if I tell you I have these open unit balls and they really cover each point at least k times, can I split them into two families, f1 and f2, where each is a covering? So can I decompose it into two coverings? You know, so you might think that if k is large enough that this is true, but actually many Levitska and Pak in 1988 constructed for every k at least one a non-decomposable k-fold covering of the Euclidean space R3 there. So that isn't the question we'll be looking at, and we won't go through their proof of that construction, but so we'll change the question a bit. So it's actually not true that uh, k-fold coverings can be decomposed. What is true is that if I have a k-fold covering of R3, and here's, uh, this is also their theorem, uh, where no point of R3 is contained in more than uh, about, let's say, a, at least where we're going to set it to t, where t will be on the order of 2 to the k over 3 members of f, then f is decomposable. So what is this saying? That it's a bit strange. It's saying that if we assume uh, that no member is covered too many times, so we have a k-fold covering, so we cover each point by at least k, but you assume that no point is covered by a lot, so exponential here in k, like 2 to the k over 3, then you can actually decompose. So it's saying if, if we have a, a large covering and the covering is kind of roughly uniform, so every uh, point is covered at least k times, but at most kind of exponential in k times, then we can actually get this decomposition. So that's a bit strange. It's saying that whatever the construction was uh, covered points very many times. So somehow that's the problem. If you point gets covered too much, maybe that's what's going to make it impossible to decompose. So a bit counterintuitive, but it makes their uh, theorem quite nice. So we're going to proceed with this. Specifically, we'll actually, the assumption there with the t and k is that e times t cubed times 2 to the 18 divided by 2 to the k minus 1 is at most 1. So you can go through that and solve for that t has to be at most 2 to the k over 3 with some constant there. But let's not do that. We'll, we'll just use this inequality. 
So now, how do we proceed? So again, this seems quite hard as, you know, we somehow have to, to decompose, we are given this infinite set of balls covered in space, and we have to decompose it into two uh, that cover space. And how are we going to do that? Well, for every x in R3, we'll let ex be the set of balls in F that contain the point x. And now we translate this problem into a hypergraph problem. So we're going to let h be an infinite hypergraph, where the vertices will be the balls, the members of F, and the edges will be these, these ex, these, the set of balls uh, containing a point x. So each point becomes an edge on the balls uh, it's in, and the vertices are the balls. And important point, we're going to take each edge only once. This is quite crucial. We're going to so it, it, what's going to happen, you have infinite ones, but it's quite possible that uh, two points have the same set of balls uh, that they're in, so we're only going to take that edge once. So we kind of make it a simple hypergraph. So given that, now we claim that once we simplify it as such, that every edge EX intersects less than T cubed 2 to the 18 other edges EY of H. So once you simplify down, there actually is not too much intersection. So let's go through that. How are we going to prove this? Well, it's just a bit of geometry. So you let Y be the set of, of Y, these points in R3, where EY intersect EX is not empty, and let B be the set of all the balls in all such Y. Uh, now what are we going to do? Well, we'll note that if Y is in Y, so if I, I have an an edge, right, this x, that would mean that dyx has to be at most 2. So if there's going to be overlap between uh, the, a ball containing x and a ball containing y, and they're unit balls, then the distance is at most 2. This implies that if we then look at all of the balls, this family uh, b there, uh, then every bi in b is contained entirely in the ball bx4, of radius 4 uh, centered at x. So that's a nice point, because they'd have to contain a point distance 2 away, and they could therefore have diameter at most 2, so they'd actually be entirely contained in a radius 4 ball centered at x, this bx4 I'll denote that as. So now we're, we're almost done with this, this claim, because y, every ball bi has, is a unit ball, so it has some exact value, but the, the volume of the ball of radius 4 is just going to be, we're three-dimensional, 4 cubed times that volume. Which then, if you think about the fact that no point is covered more than t times, is in more than t balls, we find that uh, the number of these balls is at most, well, t times the volume, but then divided by the volume of the bi's that you have. And they're all the same. And so that will work out to be 4 cubed times t, which is, of course, 2 to the 6 times t. So that's, uh, so we've proven, we're almost done. So we've proven that they're not, uh, we looked at a point x, there's not somehow, we looked at the edges intersecting it, these y, there are not too many balls involved in those edges. There's a most 2 to the 6t. And now, why are we done? Well, there's this nice geometric fact that if you have m unit balls in Rn, that those cut Rn into a most something on the order of m to the nth number of components. Uh, and this proof goes by adduction on n. So what am I saying? If you have uh, a line, if you're R1 and you had uh, m segments, you know, there'd be at most, say, 2m plus 1 uh, subsegments uh, induced by the, these segments. Uh, and generally, in, in, in two dimensions, if you had circles, you'd have uh, only on the order of m squared uh, squares. So what do I mean by component? In the sense that if we look at the space, so we're looking at a space where it's in exactly this set of balls and avoids the others. So think of the Venn diagram as made by the balls, and it's a bit weird to think, but it's actually true that there's only order m to the n of them. So you don't get the full exponential. You don't get 2 to the m as you might do if you're just thinking of a Venn diagram. You actually get on the order of m to the n as their uh, n-dimensional. So that's a nice fact, because and again, you can prove it inductively. I won't go through it and figure out exactly what the constant should be. But for circles, it works because you can track the arcs intersecting a, a circle. So that'd be a one-dimensional problem. And then use that inductively in general. Then for three dimensions, you look at the surface areas and go down to the smaller ones.
And so what this means is uh, that actually y would have to be at most 2 to the 6 t cubed, which is 2 to the 18th times t cubed. That namely, if we look at, uh, we know that the number of balls is most 2 to the 6 t, so those balls cut that local ball into at most uh, 2 to the 6 t cubed possibilities. So really, there are only so many possible different edges. Because this is, this is where we're using the simplification. Uh, each region, each component will lead to one type of edge. Uh, so one edge there. So you only end up with that many edges. All right, so that was a lot of geometry. You know, we're not doing probabilistic methods. So we did a lot of geometry there to get our claim, but now we're basically done. So you, you prove this nice uh, geometric claim that no edge intersects too many other edges in this hypergraphs. And it's, we also know that every edge of H has at least K vertices, right? We assume that every point was in at least K balls and the points are the edges, so they're at least of size K. And we showed that each edge actually intersects at most D, uh, strictly less than uh, T cubed times two to the 18th edges of H. So now we have the hypergraph where the edges are large and they don't intersect too much. And by assumption, it, exactly what we're assuming in that specific uh, inequality we used, it works out that that means that E times D plus one is at most two to the K minus one. So if you plug in the D there, that's exactly the inequality from our, kind of our, right after our statement of our theorem. And that means that we can use our property B theorem, right? So you should remember that inequality from the beginning of the video, where we said if we have a hypergraph where edges have at least K vertices, and intersect each other at most d other edges, then they satisfy property B uh, using the local lemma. But that only works for finite hypergraphs, so not infinite ones. But we'd have that every finite subhypergraph of H is true colorable, has property B. Uh, so that means so every finite one is is true colorable. And again, that's because the number of intersections, if you just pass to a subhypergraph. Uh, does an increase in the number of vertices uh, from the edges contained in them also work? And then by the standard compactness argument, which we used in this multicolored sets from before, so you can again use the standard compactness argument to say, oh, if every finite subhypergraph is too colorable, then the whole hypergraph is actually too colorable, even though it's on arbitrarily, uh, you know, infinitely many points there. So we're almost done. So we know that H is two colorable. So that means there's a red, blue, two coloring of H with no monochromatic edges. So what is that saying? We can red, blue color the vertices, which were the balls, to make sure there's no monochromatic edges, the points. So we let F1 be the set of red balls and F2 be the set of blue balls. So we partition according to this coloring. And what we conclude is since each edge, EX, contains both a red and blue ball, right? We don't have a monochromatic edge, so it contains both a red vertex, which is a red ball, and a blue ball. That means that every point is in both a red ball and a blue ball. That means that each FI is a covering of R3 as desired. So we're able to decompose uh, according to this coloring. So that was quite nice. We just used... Uh, essentially our coloring theorem from before, which was by the local lemma to show that the coloring exists once we had uh, upper bound on the number of edges in this intersection. And then we decomposed according to that coloring, where we had to, of course, use compactness to extend it to the whole infinite hypergraph. And you'll note that we won't do it, but of course you could extend this to higher uh, dimensions, uh, it, just because of that property, you'd have m to the nth, so you could do that. We also can um, extend this to more colors. So if we could use our hypergraph coloring ar argument, the chi h bound from before, we could do that as well and decompose into three, four, etc. cetera, uh, arbitrarily many families. So we could do all that, but we won't. But that shows off a nice robust use of the local lemma uh, in, in a nice geometric problem. So that concludes our lecture for today. We applied the local lemma and various things to property B, to this multicolored sets by compactness, to Ramsey, where we looked off diagonal Ramsey as well uh, to improve those with the local lemma, with the general local lemma, uh, and back to geometry where we made it, reduced it to uh, this kind of hypergraph local lemma problem and used compactness again as well to decompose coverings. So that's all we'll have for today. Until next time, See you then!